Hello, in this video I'll be going over some basic slip casting information and tips that will hopefully assist in having a successful pour. First, let's go over the items we will need. A mold, casting slip, something to mix the slip, either a stick, uh, mixing attachment, or wire whisk. I personally like to keep it simple and just use a mixing stick, a pitcher, a strainer, a bin to pour the slip, a spatula, some sticks, a cleanup tool. I personally like to use a smaller cleanup tool, but that's just personal preference, and a sponge. Next, selecting your mold and some important steps. There's several things you're going to want to make sure to take care of before you even pour your mold. So first of all, you want to be aware of the actual mold itself and take a look inside. Be aware of the pour gate and where exactly the pour gate begins and ends. So we'll go ahead and take a look, and this one is very simple. We know that the piece will be poured, and the pour gate, which is usually in a mold, it's about an inch, three quarters of an inch, the top three quarters of an inch or inch, and that part will uh, be cut away. And so you want to familiarize yourself with where the pour gate ends and where it begins. Also, this is probably a really good time to remind everyone that you don't want to be touching the inside of your mold, and we'll talk a little bit about mold care later, but when you're looking at it and examining it, uh, take care not to be touching the inside of the mold. Next, I want to briefly discuss the different types of molds. There is a one-part mold, which looks something similar to this, where you would pour into the top and then pour out and it's as simple as that and it would release. This is a two-part mold, so there's a top and a bottom, and so you would pour, remove the pour gate, and simply release and deal with cleaning the top of the mold. This is also a two-part mold, but in this case, you would pour into the top, and when you release it, there would be two sides side by side, and cleanup would involve cleaning a side seam of the piece. And the next we have this mold, which is almost a combination of the two and that we pour at the top, but here when we release the mold and clean the pour gate, we would have the top to clean. This shape here would have the seam on the side and we would be cleaning a side seam on this piece. There's also a three-part mold, which would have a piece at the bottom and then two side pieces. Uh, but for now, we're just going to discuss these simple molds. Another reason you want to open up your mold and take a look inside is you hope that whoever used the mold before you, especially if you're working in a community studio, uh, left the mold clean. So you'd take a look and make sure that it's nice and clean. And most of the times that's the case, but I have uh, been in situations where a mold just popped open and there are little bits of pieces stuck in there. So that's another reason you want to be taking a look at the inside of the mold prior to casting. So in this mold, we will see that the pour gate doesn't have a circular shape. It's a different shape here. And when we open it up again, we see it's the top inch and it's coming in at an angle. So this is the part that we would be removing and then we have the rest of our piece inside. In this last mold, we see that the pour gate is once again about an inch. It's the top part of the mold, and that's for this side of the mold. However, we see that in this smaller piece, when we look at it, we see that it's actually maybe not even an half inch. So that one's going to be a little different. This is where we'll probably use the smaller cleanup tool. 
uh, that I mentioned before, but we pour and we see the little pour gate is about a half an inch. So that's what's really important to take a look at the mold. We also have other uh, holds here for those additional attachments and you want to familiarize yourself with the inside of the mold. And again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to know where that pour gate ends and begins before you even get started. Whether you're working in your own home studio or a community studio, it's never a good idea to just leave one rubber band on the mold. If the rubber band were to snap off, uh, you could risk having slip all over the surface um, where you're working and it would just become a big mess. Um, the larger the mold, the larger the mess. Always a good idea to have two rubber bands going uh, in one direction and one or two going in the opposite direction and some studios, community studios, will often have their own rule three or four but usually they want them going in different directions. Another thing that you want to do is um, when you put the rubber bands on the mold I'm sliding one here and then turning it and sliding it here. Again, some people might think, oh, this is sufficient. I have two on there. If one goes, I have another one, it will be fine. Not the case. Another thing you wanna take into consideration is how tight these rubber bands are on the mold. Now, before I put the third one, I'm going to check, and as you can see, just by simply pushing on the mold, I am able to separate the mold. We don't want that happening. Um, as you start to pour into the mold, there's going to be some pressure that builds up from the slip, and I've seen it where there's either a, not enough rubber bands or a rubber band gives, and suddenly the mold pops apart. It might be a case that the rubber bands hold up, but still, because of that amount of pressure of the slip going into the mold, the two sides separate and you end up having a leak. And it can be a leak that causes a mess or it can just be just enough of a leak that it goes into the seam and makes it difficult to pull the piece apart. So as I put this third rubber band onto the piece, I'm just going to secure it like this and then I'm going to hold it down here and pull over to one side and then make my way over to the other side. And now I can just go ahead and adjust it. And again, this is three, but if you're in a studio that wants four, you would just repeat the process. And now if I try to go ahead and pull apart, I'm not able to do so. So that's kept it pretty secure. And that's what I want. So good idea to be cautious and put the fourth rubber band if you'd like. Might take a little bit extra time, but not as much time as it's going to take to either clean the mess or try to pry your mold apart if you have a slip in the seam of your mold. Next, I want to talk about the consistency of your slip. Um, when you first open your jar of slip, whether it's a brand new jar or one you've had for a while, um, it's going to have a thick consistency and right away uh, students will say they want to add water. You don't want to add water. You don't want to disturb the ratio of clay, water, and deflocculant. I'll go into that in another uh, lecture. So when you first stick your clay into your slip it might be a little thick and cloppy but you're going to want to go ahead and just mix it really well. And as you start to mix it, you'll see that it quickly starts to become thin. And just continue mixing, and I you want to make sure you get everything at the bottom and everything at the sides. And I usually recommend to students that once they feel that they've mixed it really well, to continue mixing for hundred times. So you can't really 
overmix a slip or glaze, but you can undermix the slip or glaze. And with all the time you put into your project, you just want to make sure that everything is successful. So go ahead and take that extra hundred turns and get it to a nice consistency. And you want to get to the point where you're at the stage where it's like cream. Okay, now that we've made sure that our slip was mixed well, we're going to go ahead and pour it through a strainer. And the reason that we want to do this is so that if there are little clay chunks or fragments in there, that they will be caught by the strainer and not go into our mold and affect the surface of our cast piece. You always want to make sure that you pour more than you're actually going to need to cast your piece. And as you can see, even though I mixed my slip really well, there are a lot of fragments in there. And I wouldn't want those on the wall of my piece. Let's say I was pouring a bowl or something. Um, I wouldn't want those showing up on the surface. There is a way that you could remove it with the tool, but you don't want to have to go through those extra steps. It's just always nice when you have a nice clean pour. Set that aside. So now we're ready to pour. I'm going to pour directly into the mold. I know that uh, in some studios they recommend that you have a dowel or a little stick over the mold and as you're pouring the slip is going on either side of the dowel or the stick. Um, you know, different studios have different ways of doing things. Um, I was taught to just pour directly into the mold. So I'm just pouring directly into the mold. And I'm going to come all the way to the top. And then stop. And then I will pour into the next piece coming all the way up to the top. And you want it to be one consistent pour. You do not want to start and stop. If you do, you'll end up with lines across your piece indicating where you started and you stopped. Next, I'll be watching my piece and as the slip starts to sink through, I will go ahead and top it off. So it's really important to stay on top of it and be watching it. And the minute it starts to settle and starts to sink, you want to top it off. So as you can see, it's starting to form a little ridge. I actually let it go a little bit more than I normally would, just for demonstration purposes so you could see. But normally I would, the minute I saw it drop, I would add more slip. I want it to be as accurate as possible. So the minute it starts dipping, I would pour. It's a little difficult to see. So I let it wait a little bit so that you could see it was actually dropping. But I will start checking it anywhere from seven to 10 minutes. And how I check it is I will stick my finger and drag the slip and I want the edge to be about the thickness of a nickel. And that will let me know that I'm at the right thickness. Any thinner than that, the piece becomes really fragile and you really don't wanna go thicker than that. So it's been about 10 minutes and I'm gonna go ahead and take my finger and then just drag it along towards the center and if you look right here you can see that my slip is about the thickness of a nickel and I have a little nickel here for reference and it's pretty close I feel like that's pretty good 
Now that my slip has reached the thickness that I would like, I'm going to go ahead and pour it into a tub and lay it on some sticks. And before I do that, um, I've gone ahead and put a stick on one side and several sticks on the other side. Sometimes I've had it where it's pouring evenly. Um, it is recommended though that you have one side a little higher than an other, especially if you want to avoid art lumps forming in the bottom of your piece. I'm going to go ahead and pour it. And I'm going to continue to let this pour until it isn't dripping anymore. And then once that happens, I will go ahead and lay it on these sticks upside down. So it seems to have stopped. I'll just lay that here. and it's at an angle. So any uh, remainder of slip would go over to one side and then drip into the pan at an angle, sliding over what would be the bottom of the piece and not coming straight down and forming uh, little drops on the bottom of your piece. So the piece may continue to drip, but once it has stopped dripping entirely, then you can go ahead and turn it over. I'm going to go ahead and move this out of the way. And I want to clean this area around the mold. So here is where I would use my cleanup tools. And once again, I prefer to use the smaller cleanup tool. As you can see, this slip right here that poured off to the side is starting to dry. It's still a little wet. You can tell it has a reflective quality to it. I usually tend to wait till it's dull or the majority of it is dull before I start to take it off of the, the mold itself. And I want to be very careful when I do it. Just gently remove it. I don't want to scratch into the mold. I want to keep the surface of the mold free from any scratches. So now I'm going to go sideways um, with my tool and I don't want to, I'll tell you why I'm doing this. I want to go in sideways with my tool. I don't want to dig in like this and possibly scratch the surface of my mold. So just kind of going in and seeing if I can lift the surface. And it looks like I'm going to be able to lift the surface and then it just really peels right off. So that was a nice clean way of cleaning it up. And then I can go in and gently remove that and I'll do my final cleanup at the end of the process. Removing the pour gate. Now here's where there are different schools of thought as far as removing the pour gate. In some studios, they recommend that before putting your mold to dry, and some people will dry it on their side and some people will dry them straight up. We can talk about that as well. But before letting it dry, uh, again, some studios will recommend that you remove the entire pour gate. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and remove the entire pour gate in one and then leave it on the other. Uh, when I go to remove it, I'm going to just want to make, again, at an angle, not straight into the mold, just a little kind of cut in there. And just want to, I'm just, I'm not really digging into the side of the mold. I'm just kind of feeling where the end of the slip is. And then now I'll just kind of go around and I don't want to be scraping the side of the mold. So I don't want any kind of scrape. I want it to lift uh, very similar to the way that it lifted off of the side here. You can see it's starting to remove away. So actually it's at its perfect stage right now. And 
then I've cut or removed the pore gate all the way to where the piece actually ends. So this is where the pore gate ends and the piece begins. The one thing again that I've seen is sometimes if you just push your tool at a little bit of an angle or dig in a little deep, you can actually dig into the piece. So this second piece right here, I'm gonna go ahead and move this back a little. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave that pore gate in until I actually release the piece. So we'll go ahead and see the difference there. And now we want to have our piece sit. And again, you can either have it sitting at its side. Again, there's a lot of people who will sit it aside or sit it up on sticks or just leave it like this. And I've been in studios where they do it both ways. They'll just leave it flat like this or prop it up with sticks underneath so that there's air in and around the mold and let it dry on its side. So while my piece is drying, um, this is where we can talk a little bit about uh, cleanup and what we do with our used slip. So there is some slip in here and I'm going to go ahead and take the spatula and gather that all into a corner. And once again, we come into an area where there are different schools of thought. What do you do with your reused slip? There are some people that will absolutely not use slip once it's been poured into a mold. The slip will have a different consistency because now it um, has had some of the water content removed, which was absorbed by the mold. And then, um, so it'd be thicker. And then other people that are afraid that uh, pieces of plaster might have gotten into it. If you're very careful, no plaster should be getting into your slip. But you can see that it is thicker. So one of the studios where I worked, they would always pour it back into the container and reuse it. And just keep in mind the next time that they used it, that the timing might be a little faster because the slip might be a little thicker. Again, avoiding adding any water, just adjusting the time, but not adding water. Or you might have a separate container where you keep your slip that's already gone through one pour, knowing that it's thicker. And again, adjusting the timing, but keeping them separate. So you have one batch of slip that is totally new slip and one that has already gone through a pour and thicker. Um, so it's up to you if you want to have a different container and keep it off to the side, if you want to go ahead and throw it back into the container that you use. I do usually recommend when I have beginning students that they do keep it separate so they can really start to get used to the timing of the casting and not have to make any adjustments at first. So up to you, but as you can see, there is quite a lot of slip and this was just a little mold. So I'll go ahead and I will probably pour this into a separate container and then begin to clean my tools, making sure not to get any slip or anything into the sink. And I can do a separate video on cleanup, how to avoid getting clay slip into the sink and uh, being efficient and cleaning up your tools. Checking on the mold. So I'm not quite at 40 minutes yet, but I'm going to take a look and see how things are coming along. And also to point out another reason why one may consider leaving the pour gate in the mold as opposed to cutting it off prior to uh, setting it to dry. As we can see on this side here, the piece that is cast is starting to pull away from the wall, indicating that it's almost there, if not there already, and that it will easily release from the mold. On this side where I've cut out the pore gate, I don't have any indication of whether or not it's at that point. There are some shadows being cast, so it makes it difficult to see. Also, now just looking at the surface of the clay, it's gone from a shiny surface to more of a dull surface. 
um, indicating that it's close to being ready to release from the mold. Another thing that happened is although I was being very careful as I was cutting the pore gate, you can see there was a little clay crumb that landed inside of the piece, which I'll have to carefully try to remove with not affecting the surface of the piece. So once again, um, something to consider when you're trying to decide whether to cut the pore gate or leave it in as the mold is drying. So it seems to be about 40 minutes now. I'm going to go ahead and remove the rubber bands from the mold. Once again, we see on this side that the slip is moving away from the wall, and here we can't really tell, but I'm going to go ahead and lift, and a couple things are happening. I was able to lift, and the piece is here, and I'll go ahead and remove that, and then we see this piece in here. The slip is releasing from the side here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a board and I will hold this like this and flip it over. And I had a nice release and there it is. Oh, I forgot to point out, I can go ahead and gently lift it, is that I don't know if you can see that little clay crumb and I'll go ahead need to go ahead and clean that up but I'll go ahead and put that to the side and then this is the piece where I left the pour gate inside oops it just kind of fell through there so it fell through but another thing I could do is push through with my finger like I said I was going to do and I'm gonna go ahead and push through and it looks like I am able to lift the piece by pushing the pore gate with my finger. So now I'll just go ahead and lift the piece and put it on the wear board. So what will happen is I will go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and lift this. And this was the pore gate and this is where I was kind of pushing through with my fingers. But now instead of kind of not knowing where I was cutting the pore gate with my tool, I will go in and cut the pore gate off, but I'll be able to see exactly what I'm doing and get a nice clean cut there. So in another video, I'll be going over cleaning your pieces, also how to remove seams or have a nice finish to a piece. And there we have the top and bottom to the piece. So in looking at my pieces here, um, another nice thing about leaving the pour gate is I don't want to be picking up any clay on my fingers. So for now, I do, would not want to cover them in plastic if they were tacky to the touch. The reason I would want to wait is I don't want to be handling the piece in any type of cleanup while it's still wet to the point where it could be manipulated. That's why I really want to wait till it's at that leather hard stage. Then I won't distort the form in any way. Probably give it about another five or 10 minutes and then begin with the cleanup. So I've set my pieces off to the side to kind of just dry up just a little bit before I cover them. And that is so that the plastic will not stick to them. In the meantime, I'm gonna take a look at my mold. My mold is pretty clean. It was a nice release. Nothing really I have to do there. I think that the person popping open this mold would think it's uh, in pretty good shape to pour. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, put that together. One thing I wanna to mention too is if you ever notice on a mold, you wanna look at the keys. These are these little bumps and make sure that they match up. You never wanna put a mold back like this and damage the keys in a piece. So make sure that they match up. I'll go ahead and cover that. And I'll show an example. In most molds, 
you'll usually have an even number and an odd number and or or in this case there's an edge cut off so that you'll know where to place the mold before you put it together i have seen molds damaged because they were put back incorrectly so always make sure that it's going to match up and line up before and then I'm gonna go ahead and take a look. Um, you don't wanna be using a wet sponge. Uh, some studios say it's okay to use a damp sponge. Some use a little scrubby, although the scrubby can be a little abrasive on the surface. So I make sure that it's uh, damp, not wet, damp. Like I've squeezed all the water out and I'll just gently give it a little swipe if I happen to see any clay on there. And there's very little. Just give it a little rub. There it goes, but I don't want it to get damp. And now I will just go ahead and I usually leave them out a few minutes before I go ahead and uh, put them back together just because there's been slip inside of them. So they're, they're damp inside and I'll just kind of, that's one of the last things I'll do before my studio session is close them back up and Place the rubber bands and I'll put the other uh, rubber band here a lot of times I'll put two rubber bands when I store but have three or four when I pour and again check with the studio if you're using a community studio and see what their policy is on the rubber bands so here's the final result it's a lidded piece and all of the cleanup was done at the leather hard stage and you do want to be doing cleanup at the leather hard stage to avoid creating any dust and everything can be accomplished at that stage and there will be a separate video going over cleaning cast pieces and ways to do it at the leather hard stage. No need to ever have to sand anything for health and safety reasons. I hope going over the basic slip casting fundamentals and tips will assist in a successful pour. If you have any comments, please feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Thank you.